Hi everybody, so joining me today we have JC Rees. JC Rees is the co-founder of the Sentient Institute alongside Kelly Witwicky as well as its research director. This year he will release the book The End of Animal Farming, how scientists, entrepreneurs and activists are building an animal-free food system where he outlines an evidence-based roadmap to a human, ethical, efficient food system where slaughterhouses are obsolete. Hi, JC. Welcome to the, to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm good. And thanks for the very kind introduction. Oh, <laughs> you don't have to thank me. Uh, okay, so I guess that to start the discussion, because there might have, there, there will surely be a lot of people out there that still don't know about these issues and even for the people who know about them sometimes people get a bit confused confused about the definition so first of all what is veganism yeah so veganism is a diet by most definitions so it's just the abstinence it's not consuming animal products um, you have some disagreement within the community of kind of how far this goes. So, for example, um, in my own case, I'm not super strict about it. So I don't uh, go through every ingredient on the ingredients list and make sure that it's not from animal origin. I'm also not trying to avoid, you know, other ethical aspects of food that I that I would tie into veganism. You know, some people think veganism means uh, having a whole foods, plant based lifestyle, um, but I'll I'll eat processed foods and stuff like that sometimes. So for me, it's just really not eating animal products. Um, and and the the three most common types of animal products are meat dairy and eggs. Um, so I do avoid those. Um, for example, sometimes bread uh, here in the United States uh, has has milk and eggs in it. Who knows why? Um, but for some reason, they've decided that's the, the tastiest or the right texture or something for consumers. So I'll still avoid that. Uh, but most of the time, it's just choosing instead of having, you know, the, the, the meat plate, I'll have something like tofu or, or, or some sort of uh, seitan, uh, which is another vegan meat substitute. Um, or sometimes I'll just have beans and rice. And, you know, I'm very happy with that personally. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And so uh, a thing that I found interesting when visiting your website is that uh, you say that you try to apply effective altruism to veganism because these are two different uh, different things in terms of ethics, let's say. So uh, how do you do it? Yeah, so my background is effective altruism entirely. So it's it's a social movement and a philosophy of trying to do as much good as possible. You know, effective altruism, effective do-gooding. Um, and it's a group of people who focus on a range of issues. So not just uh, food and, and veganism. You know, that's what I, I've chosen to focus on, but also things like um, global poverty. So it turns out that for very small amounts of money, um, you can really reduce the suffering and, and uh, for the global poor by distributing anti-malarial nets or by distributing deworming pills or these really cost-effective health interventions. Um, other effective altruists are focused on issues like artificial intelligence and nuclear weapons and how can we manage these risky new technologies for the betterment of, of humanity and, and ideally for all sentient beings. Um, so I, I was thinking in these general terms about all of these issues uh, in effective altruism and, and wondering excuse me, where I could do the most good personally. Um, when I when I crunched the numbers in, in terms of what I could do with my career, in terms of what kind of impact I could have, I, I thought working on food issues was really where I could do the most good. Um, most of the discussion focuses there on factory farming, um, which is pr my primary focus. So the industrial use of animals for food. This is um, you know the the big scary farms that you might have seen an undercover investigation of, where they have really horrific animal cruelty, animals confined in tiny cages. Um, I actually right behind me this. Um, this this PVC pipe uh, curtain is is the enclosure for my chickens. Um, so I have two chickens who live with me, and um, they they you know suffer on factory farms. So uh, we rescued them. Uh, they, for example, have their beaks cut off. Um, they only have like half a beak um, because that's standard practice to keep them from pecking at each other. When you put them all in such a tiny space, they would they would injure each other through that. Um, so they'll just sear off the front of the the animal's beak. And of course, that's that's cartilage. It it it, it is. Uh, painful for the birds um, and all sorts of these cool practices. So, so I, I 
thought that by reducing these, by by helping these farmed animals, I could do the most good. Um, I think since then it's it's widened a bit. Um, you know, I've looked a lot at uh, so-called humane farms, uh, the farms where where it seems like the animals are giving a good, lo- good lo- living a good life. Um, I've been to some of those farms. I've been to like a pasture-raised egg farm, um, and unfortunately, it turns out that there's tons of suffering on those farms too. Um, and even if you just count factory farms when it comes to the global food system, it's over 99% of animals raised for food living on factory farms. Um, in the U.S., uh, it's even worse. It's over 99%. Um, so through this effective altruism perspective, I decided that I should focus first on factory farming, and then really I should just be be researching and helping society move towards an animal-free food system. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, since you already talked about the uh, that kind of farming um, so th- there are many people on the farming standpoint that defend the notion of uh, animal welfare, let's say, as mm-hmm. you were saying, that there are certain farmers that propose um, changes to the way animals are raised and things like that for them to to be treated in, in a better way, let's say. So uh, would you say that Uh, I guess not because of what you already talked about, but would you say that those kinds of approaches would be enough or at least sufficiently good or not? Yeah, so I think they can definitely reduce suffering. Um, there are things like uh, removing those cages that the animals are confined in that definitely have the animals living a better life. Um, unfortunately, it's it's actually the same as when it comes to human issues. So with human issues, uh, when we're commodifying and, and using and exploiting other humans, you know, as was the case with slavery and, and all of its forms around the globe, um, you inevitably get tons of suffering. You inevitably get cruelty, even if you try and pass, you know, uh, welfare reforms. Um, so I think, unfortunately, it's going to be the same when it comes to animals. So like with the de-beaking I was talking about of the chickens, if you were to, to stop de-beaking them, a lot of farmers will say like, oh, we've, we've stopped de-beaking our chickens. It's a great boon to welfare. Uh, but unfortunately, that means the animals are then pecking each other all the time because they're, they're still so confined. Um, so that's leading to actually more suffering in a way. Um, and you get all sorts of these unfortunate consequences. To, to really have a farm that's truly humane, um, it has to be uh, an unrealistic uh, uh, price point. It has to be an unrealistic level of, of human labor. It has to be, you know, I grew up in rural Texas um, in the southern United States, a, a big farming community. And and some of the people who had, you know, a few goats in their backyard, uh, they really took good care of them. But there was no way that you could feed the world with that. I mean, the amount of resources it uses, like land and, and, and uh, water and other costs, um, it just makes it unsustainable. So I think in the long run, while I'd certainly like to see Right now, let's move more towards humane animal farming for the animals we still do farm. I would like to see us transition all the way to an animal-free food system. Mm-hmm. And we, would you say that, for example, people who raise animals in their homes, that, for example, people that have chicken and uh, chicken lay eggs, for uh, people uh, that take those eggs uh, and... Um, and eat them. So would would you say that people who do that and also, for example, if someone were to raise animals, to have animals in their home and mm-hmm. and let them grow and live and if uh, the, uh, those animals died of a natural death and, mm-hmm. then, uh, and then they were to eat them, would you say that, that those are ethical choices to make? Yeah, so I subscribe to kind of a a philosophy of anti-speciesism. So this means I don't think species itself is is a morally relevant um, ethical consideration. Uh, So I would approach that case in the same way that I would approach it for for humans. Um, I would think, well... Um, if if you were in a culture where where eating uh, humans was common and abusing them and whatnot, and you you had some humans and you wanted to eat them for some reason, like you 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 might intuitively think this is okay with welfare, um, but but um, I think my intuitions at least um, are that there's still something wrong with the, the commodification and the exploitation, um, and I think it has to do with what I what I was just saying about inevitably cutting corners. Um, so while I don't make an enemy out of, of um, people raising their own their own animals or people having small farms even um, or in some countries it's 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 a little more common to have these situations even on a commercial scale um, though though it tends to get a lot of cruelty as you get bigger and bigger um, but but I don't make an enemy out of those and they're not my, my priority uh, I think I think what we need most in society right now is to get those factory farms gone we, we need to, to tackle them by providing 
cheap, you know, nutritious, tasty, uh, plant-based and 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 cell cultured um, meat, dairy, and eggs. Um, but in an ideal world, I don't think we'd be using any animals the same way. In our ideal world of of uh, working with other humans, we're not eating other humans, even if we're we're treating them humanely. We see that as still something that's wrong, and we apply kind of a heuristic of just um, don't exploit other other humans, don't um, you know use them for your own gains without considering their interests. Um, and I think we need to adopt that same sort of um, what is an anti-species standpoint for animals. Mm -hmm. So on the ethical side of things, uh, animal welfare is one of the facets of veganism. Another big one is environmentalism, right? So uh, in what way does veganism relate to environmentalism? Yeah, so the when we think abstractly about kind of why factory farming exists and, and why it's so bad for animals, um, the, the answer is that it's using sentient, uh, complicated living organisms, animals, um, to produce uh, really simple products. So you're producing just just meat, which is fat, protein, carbohydrates, water in a certain cell structure. That's all it is. Um, and we're by uh, our, our method for doing that is having these animals with brains, with with hooves, with hair, with teeth, who walk around, who think and feel, who aren't used to um, you know the the industrial environment and this sort of thing. We've tried to breed them to be more efficient. So, for example, farm animals have gotten a lot bigger. Um, but still, they're, they're doing a lot of extra processes. Um, and these extra processes are both um, bad from an animal welfare standpoint and from an environmental sustainability standpoint. So just any time you have a system where you're, you're putting in tons of resources for things other than your final product, um, you're going to get a lot of waste and, and a lot of, for example, manure. You know, you get tons of just literal chicken shit and, and, and pig feces and manure coming out of factory farms that's polluting land and waterways. Um, and and it's, it's really um, a huge, huge amount because of the scale at which these animals are farmed. Um, so, so to go through kind of the, the main things people talk about, uh, you have local pollution. So, so like with, with, um, that sort of waste as well as waste from chemicals and whatnot used on, on factory farms that are then seeping into the land. Um, you have greenhouse gas emissions. So it just takes a ton of energy to, to, to raise these animals, to do things like, um, grow the food that they're being fed. Uh, you know, they're mostly fed, uh, corn and soy. Um, so when people complain about, you know, mass crop production being bad for the environment, really most of those crops are going to feed farmed animals. Um, so that just inevitably creates a lot of energy waste, um, which is leading to, to more fossil fuels being burned and that sort of thing. Um, additionally, you have uh, resource depletion like uh, land and water. Um, so just growing growing the animals on um, the farm themselves and then and then having all the land you need for the soy or the corn or whatever sort of feed or if they're grass fed you know in one of those more humane situations um, you're still uh, having to have a lot of grassland to, to, to upkeep the animals um, and then and then the water that they take so just to, to have a uh, animal living their normal life and consuming water the way humans do. You know, we drink a lot of water and then we use the restroom a lot. Um, and animals are doing the same things. Uh, same with crops. They take tons of water to, um, to, to grow. Um, so maybe those are three main issues. Um, there are lots of people today who honestly don't even care about the animal issue and are just going vegan based on environmental grounds. Um, there was a big documentary in the U.S. recently called Cowspiracy, or several years ago, um, that's been one of the biggest contributors to people uh, adopting a plant-based lifestyle, and it was just focused on the environmental issue. So it's, it's, it's really important to a lot of people. Exactly. And another point that is related to environmentalism and that is very associated with veganism as well is, um, okay, let's put it this, this way, organic agriculture, because I mean, there seems to be a lot of vegans uh, that the, uh, defend organic agriculture because many of them say that is a more natural approach to, mm -hmm. far to farming. What is your take on this? Are you for organic agriculture and, uh, as many people also are, against GMOs or not? 
Yeah, so first I would say that I'm not an expert on these topics. Um, my expertise is, is animal agriculture and the issues with that. I mean, then I study historical social movements. Um, but uh, from from my read of kind of the expert consensus, you know, I'm not I'm not using natural as my yardstick. I'm not using even the general public opinion as my yardstick. I'm just like looking at scientists, um, taking whatever they think. And since I'm not a scientist on that issue myself, I'm just going with their majority view, um, which I think is that... Um, organic agriculture as it is today is is has a lot of issues. Um, maybe it can be beneficial in some ways, but it's it's certainly not the holy grail some people have made it out to be. Uh, you know, I'm not too focused on consuming organic food myself. I mean, I'm not going out of my way to consume non-organic food either. Um, but I think. Um, People are concerned about it for genuine reasons. They're concerned about pesticides or other things, um, but we should tackle those things more directly instead of holding up a label of, of natural or organic as, as uh, yeah, our end goal. Um, so with GMOs, um, I'm really excited in general about technology and its ability to improve food. Um, unfortunately, there's there's a public roadblock when it comes to that because lots of people don't want technology in their food. You know, they want technology in their in their iPhone or in their car, um, but they don't want it going inside of their body. I think this is just a gut psychological reaction, the way that some people, you know, get really nervous about shots or vaccines. Um, it just is this feeling of like, oh, it's 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 penetrating my body. Um, it's it's very visceral. It's very uh, instinctive in that way, um, but it turns out that that the evidence for GMOs seems to be that they're not causing significant health issues. Um, that when used correctly, you know, they can be very good for for crop yields and the environment and these sorts of things. Um, so I'm excited about them. Of course, I've most of the people I know who who have concerns about GMOs are of the more scientist thoughtful type, and their concerns are instead like the use of GMOs. Uh, so far historically by certain corporations to uh, create monocultures or to um, dis disempower um, agricultural workers or whatnot. And I think those are important issues, but those aren't intrinsic issues to GMOs. Um, we should still be excited about GMOs just when they're used right. There's there's no reason to have a blanket opposition to those. Um, so this is different than my view on you know factory farming and, and animal farming because I think any time you're factory farming animals and, and I think inevitably factory farm. Uh, inevitably animal farming turns into factory farming, um, you're going to have this sort of cruelty and stuff. But GMOs are much more a mixed bag. You have to be careful. You have to, to, to look for certain usage. You know, some of the examples that I hear about, like, I don't know, uh, the GMOs that save the Hawaiian papaya industry. Uh, this was a very clear example of just like a GMO prevented a, a, an infectious disease that was destroying the crops. And like, who could disagree with that? Um, so I'm, I'm definitely excited about a lot of GMO applications. Mm -hmm. But you don't agree when we try to apply bioengineering to animals? Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting question. I mean, I have the same view that I do with, with humane farming in that way, in that, like, no matter what sort of improvements you're making on the current animal farming system, they're just inherently inefficient and they're inherently sentient beings and you're going to run into tons of issues. So it's it's not my ideal situation. I, I'd like us to move towards uh, vegan food. Um, but uh, in, in the near term, um, certainly some of it can be useful. So for example, um, with, with dairy cows, um, they're, they're dehorned in the US. Um, so, so you take a kind of a a hot metal tool and 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 burn the uh, root of the horn uh, in in baby dairy cows, um, and this is this is terrible and it's very common throughout the dairy industry. Um, but you can actually, um, I'm not sure if it's if it's uh, biotech or if it's just breeding, um, but you can you can uh, have the dairy cows grow hornless, um, and I think that's that's great as a temporary measure for just keeping that that um, mutilation, that, that surgery, quote unquote, from happening to those poor animals. Um, but uh, in the long run, I like to see us just not using dairy cows, not using animals at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and I think that a problem, and please correct me if you don't agree with this, a problem that, that comes from many vegan activists and that uh, is that they tend to condemn, uh, condemn uh, in the moralistic sense, people too much on, mm. the, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, don't you think that there are many people that are part of the veganist movement, let's say, uh, that conflated too much with nutrition and health mm. and then start making absurd claims about how veganism could cure this and that or could prevent this or that? 
Yeah, two really good questions. So my role in the, in the vegan movement is um, I'm not usually a, a spokesperson as much as I am the person who's trying to get other vegans to do things better. Um, so when it comes to, to condemning people, um, so so most of most of my day to day work is is studying historical social movements and psychology to figure out what the most effective tools are to to build a movement and to change society. Um, so it turns out that the farmed animal movements focus on individual veganism and on um, condemning people like you said um, and and getting them to go vegan seeing themselves and their own diet as as the bad guy and just really focusing on individual consumption change um, is is has virtually no historical precedent so so basically no social movement has been successful uh, using this as their primary tool instead we've always seen seen consumer action so boycotts people people staying away from animal products or staying away from you know um, slave made goods or staying away from I don't know if you wanted to talk about GMOs or organic has always just been a tool um, for a broader push for policy change, uh, for technology change, uh, for, for changing society as a whole in those ways. I mean, I want to see the, the, the farmed animal movement make those changes. Um, so I'm much more, that's like um, with, with my book title and, and its main, the thrust of the book is a focus on changing institutions and changing society rather than condemning individuals for their own diet. Um, I could list off a ton of benefits, you know, like it reduces defensiveness. I mean, I, I, I think you mentioned you were vegan, so uh, you might have had conversations with somebody where just as soon as you start talking about veganism you just feel so many walls go up they just immediately have every excuse in the book you know lions eat meat they're talking about what would you do if you're on a desert island all of this um, and it's just impossible to have a constructive conversation whereas if I talk to somebody about factory farming or animal farming as, a, as an institutional problem and condemn that and point to it as like oh here's this bad thing over here do you want to join me in fighting it everyone's on board every everyone agrees that we should get rid of factory farming i mean it's because it doesn't have that individual focus um with your other point about nutrition um yeah so i'm i'm not as convinced that uh veganism or plant-based food is is really good for us nutritionally uh, i'm not as convinced as other other vegans are usually um i think this is partly just the nature of nutrition evidence so with with animal suffering you can just really you can look at what's going on on a factory farm we have tons of data on what's going on all the practices and it's really clear that it's very bad from an animal suffering standpoint uh same with environmentalism uh, but with nutrition, you're relying on mostly, um, you know, not even experiments. Instead, there are observational studies of different populations. Um, you know, vegans like to talk a lot about blue zones, which are uh, places where uh, people with vegan or predominantly plant-based lifestyles have lived to v for very long, uh, lived very long lives. Um, but if I bring those up with somebody who's on the other side, on like a high fat, high meat uh, kind of nutrition standpoint, they can point to just the same number of of populations who are doing really well on on uh, you know meat heavy lifestyles. Um, so I, I run into all sorts of issues like this. I do think that currently the evidence weighs in favor of of having more plant based foods and definitely having a lot less meat than I mean the U S. and and most of Europe is is eating right now. That's like pretty clearly a bad thing. Um, but I don't think it weighs in favor of all the uh, sensationalist, you know, uh, veganism can cure your your hair loss and your your cancer and all these different things. Um, and I think we do um, a lot. In, um, I think we discredit ourselves whenever we do that as, as vegans. Um, I think we, we undermine ourselves. There are so many great reasons for people to go vegan or for us to end factory farming. We just don't need to rely on that stuff. I know people love to talk about it because, I mean, who doesn't want to, you know, find the next cure to cancer? Um, but it's so dangerous, and it just gets us, I mean... The way veganism is sometimes portrayed in, in media, I mean, fortunately, it's it's portrayed very positively sometimes, but sometimes it's just, I mean, it's a laughing stock. I mean, people like to poke fun of anyone who's doing a unusual individual lifestyle, um, something like veganism or something like a weird religion, um, and they'll find any way they can to, to make fun of it and... and um, view it as something that you know not everyone should adopt and said it's this quirky thing um, and that's just I mean you're doing their work for them when you when you make these sensationalist health claims mm -hmm. uh, and I mean the knowledge we have about how animals are sentient beings and so on uh, comes from science and particularly in this case from biology so we need to have this knowledge this scientific knowledge to be able to better sustain the ethical stance that is behind veganism, right? So, uh, isn't isn't it better? And and this is also another criticism I have of uh, some vegan people, at least, that 
from a certain point on they start uh, again uh, telling lies about uh, our organism and saying for example and stating for example that people are not really omnivores mm -hmm. <laughs> so, sometimes they even go to the extreme of saying that people are in fact herbivores with the, which is completely untrue uh, and i mean do, uh, wouldn't you say that if we have science to back uh, to back up this ethical stance uh, that, that is espoused by veganism, I, I, isn't isn't it better as well to um, to tell the truth uh, about uh, other aspects of science and say that people are in fact omnivores and even in our evolutionary history, meat played the big role. In, in our evolution, for example, in the development and of our brains and so on. So I mm -hmm. guess that what I'm asking is that we shouldn't lie about these right. things to promote veganism, right? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely on track. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who who thought that this was actually a wise choice. I, th I think what you're instead getting is is mostly people who are uh, not really thinking too much about what they're saying and not really thinking too much about what they're believing. I mean, I'm I'm consider myself yeah part of the effective altruism movement, part of the skeptic community. You know, I'm always trying to think through and make sure I'm forming proper beliefs about the world, even if they don't go in favor of of, of my ethical views. Let's say, you know, it, it's I accept that maybe maybe some amounts of animal products could be good for you from a nutrition standpoint. That's just something that I have to live with and it's it's the truth of the world so it's what I need to believe um, but when you come to a community like vegans um, which many of them are of that mindset and they are critical thinkers many of them also just just aren't into that you know they're instead focused on what did my favorite you know Instagram star say today and I'm going to, to regurgitate that um, and I think you get you get a lot of problems that way um, there's a there's definitely a community of vegans who would identify as I don't know skeptic vegans or um, there there's like a vegans and GMO group that that does a lot of this um, who are focused on evidence-based claims and I think that's really great I'd like to see them grow in prominence in the community um, help help check each other um, that'd be for the betterment of us all mm -hmm. yeah that would be great <laughs> yeah. so uh, and what is your position on animal testing because I mean do you think that it is always unethical or that until we develop b uh, better alternatives to test for example, drugs and things like that, or even cosmetics, we could at least continue using animal models to perform scientific studies and develop medication, for example. Yeah, so it's a good question, and it ties into exactly what you were saying in terms of, um, you know, should we should we uh, espouse lies um, when when they just line up with our ethical views? So I hear many vegans who say, "Oh, animal testing is really ineffective, and actually, it'd be for the betterment of of humans and for animals if we stop doing it." Um, it's a funny example because um, I studied neuroscience in school, and um, in that, when you're studying the brains of animals, like, no, there's no way to do that without an animal. Um, if you're if you're doing some sort of invasive research, I mean, I, I did human research. Unfortunately, we, we have you know fMRI and, and other tools that where you don't actually have to go inside the animal's head. Um, but but I think it, it points to a general point that yeah, at this point in time, just like the technology isn't fully there. Um, with food, it's a different story because uh, you know if everyone switched to rice and beans today, that would be great. There there would be no issue. We don't need any technology. The technology when it comes to food is instead trying to give people the exact taste and texture they want. Um, but that's a pretty superficial thing. I'd be okay with you know denying people that pleasure. Whereas if animal testing is actually um, you know improving some people's health outcomes, um, that could be more useful. Um, but this also ties back into what we were saying earlier in terms of the the commodification and the exploitation of a group and what that leads to. Um, so I think if we were to ban animal testing today, um, we would see a huge push for alternatives to to, to biomedical research, um, and we could have some forms of research or some forms of animal testing that really nobody's opposing. So for example, um, there's a group called Farm Sanctuary who rescues farmed animals and they're sponsoring a 
um, it's called Someone Not Something. It's a it's a scientific research program, but it's focused on um, behavioral research of animal cognition. Um, and that's been uh, where we've gotten a lot of the interesting findings about, for example, uh, the sentience of animals and the intelligence of animals, the fact that, you know, different animals have different forms of tool use and where did that develop in our evolutionary history. Um, and those forms of animal testing where, where it's non-invasive and it's done, you know, with a clear focus on ethics, I don't think anyone's really opposed to. Um, similarly, I think there, there are a couple of bans on uh, great ape research now. I think New Zealand might have one, um, except for when it's in the interest of the species. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to, you know, decrease the rate of an infectious disease in the great ape population, uh, sure, you can test on great apes because it's serving their own self-interest. Um, the same way some, you know, humans are willing to take drugs that will are experimental, um, but they know will be for the betterment of, of other humans down the road. Um, so I think we can still have animal testing in, in these ways, um, but I'm I'm optimistic and, and, and would like us over the next few years to really focus on pushing for, for better technologies and to move away from animal testing in general. I just, I really don't want us to be using animals in any ways that we wouldn't use humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so now to talk about a very specific subject. What is your opinion on uh, lab meat? So yeah. would you say that to take cells from animals and to make them grow in the laboratory and to, and to produce meat that way and then for people to eat that meat, would you think that that would go along um, a vegan ethic? Yeah, I think it would, 100%. Um, so some of the concerns uh, from vegans about about uh, cultured meat or clean meat or lab meat, it goes by a lot of different names, um, are things like that it uses fetal bovine serum. So um, when you have those cells in culture, uh, they need some sort of nutrients, some sort of growth factors around them, um, so the cells will actually grow. They can't just grow in air um, or in water. Um, and that historically in, in research labs has come from um, the blood of, of, of cow fetuses um, or the blood of other animals like horses or, or, or mice or whatnot. Um, and that's really unfortunate, but it's just not how it's going to be made at scale, um, even if it's being used in some research. And I mean, all sorts of things are used in research. Um, so at scale, it's instead going to be plant-based serum or plant-based media um, that's coming from, I don't know, soybeans or, or, or corn or whatever. I mean, it's just having the same constituents. Just right now, the research they need to do is, is putting that in there. So I think at scale, it's going to be an ethical process. Um, and you have that initial, you know, you take the sample, the, the sample of cells, but that's from a live animal. Um, and with what I was saying about, you know, don't do things to animals that you wouldn't do to humans, like they can take my cells if they want. I mean, I don't know if anyone's going to want to eat human meat, um, but I'd be totally fine with somebody taking a small biopsy for me and, and using it. Um, I don't think that's any issue of, of, you know, infringing upon animal rights. Um, so I, I'm very excited about it. I think just in practice with like how is society exactly going to be able to transition to an animal free food system, uh, cultured meat is going to be a very important uh, part of that. Um, just most people aren't willing to eat the rice and beans or even the plant based, you know, burgers and whatnot. Um, so I think we're going to need to give them cultured meat. And, and right now there are some very good nonprofits working on it, as well as academic researchers and some businesses emerging um, that are working on this. And I'm, I'm very excited about all of that. Mm -hmm. And are there any any particularly interesting solutions to substitute animal prog products that might um, uh, might come down the pipeline in the near future? Let's say that you would like to talk about. Uh, sure. So um, a lot of people have heard about cultured meat, but there's actually also cultured uh, milk and eggs. Um, so to do this, they actually use a much easier process, um, which means it might be on the market much sooner. Um, so so the, the basic idea here is that um, milk and, and egg whites and whatnot are composed of certain proteins. I mean, they're acellular, so they're just kind of suspended in fluid. Um, so all we really need to get are those proteins. And the cool thing about them is that we already have a process for getting specific proteins um, without without getting them from animals. I um, mean, it's been used to get um, uh, insulin for diabetics for a few decades now instead of harvesting those from pigs. Um, and this is much cheaper and it's been a, a great boon for, for diabetics. Um, it's also been used for rennet, which is um, from the lining of a cow's stomach and it's used in cheese making. Um, that now mostly comes, the, the chiamycin, and that comes from uh, this new, new method. Um, so to, to basically 
outline the basics of that method scientifically, um, it's it's taking a certain genes, um, and so it, it's it's genetic modification, um, adding those genes to a microbe like a like a yeast cell, and um, these these genes just encode the production. Of, of that protein. So it's like the little instruction manual for all the proteins that the yeast is creating. It says, oh, actually just focus on um, this one, focus on, on chymicin or focus on insulin. Um, and you can do this for, for casein and whey, um, these, these, these main proteins found in, in uh, milk and cheese. Um, and, and it's much easier. The GMOs don't end up in the final product. You know, it's just the yeast. Um, so it's, it's not technically a GMO. Um, so even if you're opposed to those, this is still actually like validly a non-GMO food. Um, as far as I know, I don't know if they have any plans to push it out to market just yet, um, but they're definitely working on it slowly. Um, collagen, so collagen is, is the main constituent of, of gelatin and also it's in a lot of cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. Um, that is already being produced this way and uh, sold commercially to, to, I think, pharmaceutical companies um, by a company called Geltor in the U.S. Um, so that's really exciting and that's actually the first like cellular agriculture product um, that's already on the market. Um, it's, just, it's just being used for pharmaceutical companies, so they're willing to pay a lot more so it doesn't have to get the economies of scale that all the food companies need right now um, so keep an eye out for that it's really exciting mm -hmm. great so uh, and we already talked a lot about your uh, about your personal ideology let's say mm -hmm. uh, and the scientific basis for it but what are the specific aims and goals that you have at the sentient institute yeah, so we're broadly focused on uh, expanding humanity's moral circle. So this is something that's been happening since since the origin of humanity, when we wanted to increase our our, our circle of compassion to um, the people in our towns and villages, and then to you know city states, then to other countries, and of course today across across species, across race, gender, etc. Um, and we want to to study that phenomenon and and figure out how we can most effectively further that expansion. Um, so our main focus right now is on farm animals and that's why I've done so much research into it um, and we want to understand how do we get people to care more about farmed animals, get get um, you know animal farming to, to go into the dustbin of history. Um, and we do this by yeah, studying historical social movements. Um, with, with GMOs, actually, we have a big uh, case study coming out on, on them. Um, so this is looking at the strategies that were used by pro-GMO advocates as well as anti-GMO advocates um, in, the, in the mostly like the 90s and um, seeing how they got to market, why they have been so largely rejected by society, um, and, and comparing and contrasting that with uh, potential new um, ethical technologies, so, so like clean meat. Um, so, for example, uh, when, when GMOs first emerged, they were done, uh, or at least they were seen as being done by large corporations, um, you know, behind closed doors, putting it in our food system to increase profits. Um, there was no discussion of like, oh, GMOs could reduce world hunger. Um, but fortunately with clean meat, we've seen an entirely different discussion of the technology. It's been focused on as a solution to factory farming, as an ethical um, solution. It's been promoted by uh, activists. It's been promoted by young startups, um, a few large food companies, but they're just kind of more supporters. It's definitely not the main narrative. And, and we'd like to, at Sentience Institute, we'd like to see this continue for clean meat, this focus on, on the ethics, um, because it seems uh, both both better for you know helping society expand their moral circle and also just better for avoiding the, the negative perception that some other food technologies have gotten. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just before we finish, uh, you already talked a little bit about it here today, but could you please just give people a small teaser about your upcoming book, The End of Animal Farming? And uh, as well, if you are active on social media, just tell people uh, where you are active and how you how they can find you. Sure. Yeah. So um, I've actually been working on my page proofs. Um, so this is like the 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 printed out copy of the book. Um, going through with the red pen and. Uh, copy editing it all day. Um, but yeah, that's my main focus right now is a book on on this topic, on the end of animal farming. Um, it's discussing a lot of these strategies we talked about today. So things like um, the transparency in comparison to GMOs, things like the focus on institutions over individuals, um, all the different sorts of technologies that are being lined up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of speculating about which ones are going to be most effective, um, which ones are going to pan out, when are they going to pan out, you know, what's the timeline for the end of animal farming. Um, it's really something that I think is is kind of unique 
unique in the literature and I'd like to see more people doing it, which is just like a perspective uh, analysis of a social movement um, because social movements are so fascinating and so important for 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 our impact on the world and 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 human well-being um, and yet they're not the subject of much rigorous academic study um, so that's my main focus with the book and I've been working on it for about uh, a year and a half now and um, well the research has been going on since before that and it'll come out in November so keep an eye out I think it's already on Amazon and stuff for pre-order um, and then yeah I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter um, it's my my first and last name JC Reese uh, no no underscores or anything I'm also on Facebook. Um, people can also feel free to reach out to me personally. Um, I'm always eager to chat more about all the topics we've discussed today um, and, and collaborate with people. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you do. I'm, I'm a big fan of your, your YouTube channel. Uh, you cover a, a really wide range of important topics. And it seems like you personally have developed a lot of a big breadth of expertise, whereas you know I'm kind of more focused on one topic, at least for right now. So that's really impressive to me. Congratulations. Well, uh, thank you a lot, man. <laughs> thank you a lot for a compliment. And uh, I would also like to thank you for taking a bit of your time to being here with us today. I, I think it was a really great conversation and in, an informative one, which is very important great. for people today. So again, thank you. And man, have a nice day. And I... Uh, once the, as soon as the interview is out, I will let you know. Okay, great. Yeah, so good to speak with you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Bye. have a good day. Bye. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you.